Hello my friends and welcome to another episode of Running with Ryan. Today we are going running with an incredibly inspirational guy. He's been one of the top ultra runners for years. He was named North American Ultra Runner of the Year in 2011. He's won multiple USA Track and Field trail titles. And he was one of those crazy guys to run across the Grand Canyon and back and set a fastest known time of just under seven hours. By the way, that's about 50 miles. In 2015, he was running right back here on a mountain called Bear Peak, just a little training run. He had a very unfortunate fall and a boulder rolled down, smashed his leg. Over the next year and a half, he had more than 10 surgeries and he was constantly in pain. He made the tough decision to have his left leg below the knee amputated and now he runs with a prosthetic foot. Ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna love this guy. He's one of the nicest guys in the sports, Dave Mackey. What's up, my man? Hey, how you doing? How's it going? How are you? Doing great. I can't Good. thank you enough for doing this. I'm really excited. I'm happy to do it. All right, my man. <laughs> <laughs> on a day like this. Uh, I think you said you need to put on your running blade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's. Uh, I'll throw that on and we'll get going. On um, prosthetics, it's um, there's different things that get attached to a socket, okay. and uh, one of them is a running blade, which I have here. Fill our blade. The socket is made of just carbon fiber. Throw this on. I ski in this. This one right here. I kind of do. I work in it. Hike around in it. But for running, a blade is much more dynamic and gives some energy return. I'm really excited you brought me to South Boulder. I never come to South Boulder. Yeah, that's the um, the uh, secret part of town that a lot of people don't. <laughs> Don't hang out in, which is fine for me. I know. I mean, these, awesome. these views are incredible out here. So these are uh, kind of the trails you run a lot, or I I typically am uh, west of Broadway, west of 93. That's where I, kind of where I live. So I just go up in the the trails and the peaks there. And uh, lately, I've been running up Bear Canyon a lot to the backside of Green and tag the summit and come back down that way. So you just dropped your kids off at school. What's your daily routine like? <laughs> um, it depends. Like, I work like four or five days a week. Watch out for the poop! <laughs> <laughs> I, so, if I'm not working, I, I usually have one or two week days off. And, yeah, get the kids ready and go to uh, get them to school, work a work day. I work at an urgent care. And uh, I'm a regular dad, I guess, besides having one leg running around. <laughs> <laughs> so, how does. How does running feel? How, you haven't had that all that long, right? The blade? Right, yep. Uh, well, almost two years, I guess, because I had my leg amputated two and a half years ago. Okay. Um, after a year and a half, by the accident almost four years ago, and then a year and a half later. And the accident was pretty much right on that mountain right back there, right? Yeah, on top of Bear Peak. Top of Bear Peak. <laughs> yeah, the summit there. Um, yeah, it's a lot of complications from the initial open fracture. But yeah, having the amputation was probably the best choice. Yeah. Yeah, and so then, you lived I, for a year and a half with your leg and multiple surgeries and infections, and it just, yeah. it never came back right. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it, uh, I had a persistent kind of bone infection, basically, that wouldn't allow for the bone grafting to take and uh, hardware failure and yeah just that infection just wouldn't go away yeah it wasn't like you know like a skin infection and cellulitis which what people get typically but in the bone it can really be hard to rid the body of it yeah. so because I couldn't I just couldn't heal and I had options as far as surgeries but um, those would have delayed things for probably, yeah. two, you know, a couple of years. And and I, I watched some videos of you, and you just had never looked comfortable. Yeah, I was on a cane. I had scar tissue in the leg, which would always would be there, and probably would always be a problem. And uh, I just found that the amputation was the, the best choice. 
after talking to a lot of surgeons and people. Um, yeah. And I imagine that was an excruciating decision. Yeah. It was, I mean, the accident happened and, you know, I had, I thought, you know, when that occurred that I'd go in for surgery that night, I'd have things fixed up and maybe, you know, right off the year for events, if, you know, and to heal up yeah. like anybody does when they break their leg. But, um, but yeah, at least one thing led, led to another. And then eventually it came to a point like, holy crap, I'm gonna <laughs> lose my leg. And yeah, it was, but I was doing, doing all these steps to avoid that, because it really wasn't a likely scenario, but as time went by, it became more possible. And then, yeah. I don't know if excruciating would be the term to describe it as more. Um, at a certain point, it was kind of like a relief, because after a year and a half of, you know, 13 sur surgeries, it's kind of like, oh, wow, I have a way forward. You know, the problem will be gone if I amputate it. Yeah. I don't recommend that. I recommend <laughs> if someone was in my shoes to go through every possibility within reason to avoid it. But, um, I think it was definitely excruciating as far as the actual day of the surgery. Um, yeah, that was, that was extremely difficult. <laughs> it was like, damn, I'm actually going to do this. Yeah, and, and correct, me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had like a party the night before. It was the night before Halloween and everybody came over and signed your leg. Yeah, I, um, a buddy of mine, Mike Hewitt, he, he thought I should have a party. He's, he's that kind of guy. And I thought, oh, sure, why not? So I, um, yeah, it's a flat irons running company in South Boulder. Just uh, invited everybody to come. The next day I went to surgery. Yeah, yeah, my uh, my son wrote on it, like, I love Connor, and, um, I mean, I have, I have pictures of it, too, There's all my friends writing on it, <laughs> that's long gone, it's, it went in the incinerator at the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not like signing a cast where you can save it and put it on your wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you woke up the next day, or after the surgery, and your foot was gone. What was yeah. The, what was that like? Uh, it was hard. I, I see pictures and video of me the, the day after surgery, and it's, uh, man, it, it was really difficult. That's, um, that year after the amputation from day one was extremely difficult, because it's not, you just can't go back, you can't loosen the body part, and woke up, and, like, holy shit, but, um, you know, I also knew that it was kind of like one step at a time to get through the whole process, and, and uh, it was, uh, yeah, extremely difficult overall. Look at these little calves. Look at these little calves. <laughs> hey guys, how's it going? <laughs> it's springtime in the Rockies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, let's get away from the dark side of this and talk about <clears throat> the positive side of, of post-surgery and what you were able to do after that. Yeah. You know. um, yeah, so the, my goal was to be, you know, as active as possible, as mobile as possible. I, I didn't really care about competing in races that much, but I did want to complete some different, you know, events. Hey. And just to kind of get back to where I was, just to physically and emotionally and spiritually be back and, you know, the same person I was before. And I knew that was possible with one leg. So, I was, um, but the year after the amputation, just it's a long process adapting to a, a socket, a prosthetic socket, and you go through different changes in the limb, and that just takes time to adapt to those. Absolutely. But the, um, yeah, I knew that I'd, I'd get back at it eventually. I didn't know what, to what degree, but I, I was able to complete some running events and sports events this last year. That was kind of my goal. Not just some sports events. He completed the lead man. He's being very humble. Talk to us about the lead man. Um, it's a trail marathon in June and then early July of the 50 mile bike, mountain bike race or 50 mile running race. Um, all in the mountains above Leadville, around Leadville. And then almost a month later, you'd bike the Leadville 100 bike. Have you biked that? I have not done that yet. I really want to do it, but uh, uh -huh. I have not. Yeah. 
I'm sure you get like 100 miles on your bike like, in two days. Yeah. <laughs> Every day. Yeah, Every I do. Week. I do bike a lot. I like my bike. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 100 mile bike. Then next year, next day, do a 10k, and then six days later, do the 100 mile um, Led Bull 100 run. Wow. Because it takes a while to get your balance right with the with the prosthetic leg and to figure out how to run again, right? Yeah. 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 It's uh. The balance is, yeah, one thing, it's not Watch out, killer bad. geese. <laughs> yeah. All right, continue, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no, the, the balance is isn't too bad, like running on this flat trail right here, it's really not, uh, not bad. With rocky stuff, you just have to place the foot uh, more carefully, but uh, it really all comes down to the interface of the, the actual socket with the skin yeah. and the limb. And that's where, you know, you can have you know, skin breakdown or get uh, little abrasions and rubbing and friction. Yeah. So you have to, Hello. Um, managing that can be difficult. In the 100 mile run, I was always make, making a dozen times I stopped to make little adjustments or to put a little tape over one area. It's just like someone would tape their foot, you know, if they had blisters. Actually, the, the worst blister I had was on my, my good foot. <laughs> I lost almost the whole sole of my foot. Oh, no. <laughs> but, uh, and your buddy Bob Rafika was out there with you, yeah. pacing you, and there were moments where you were like, I'm done, right? Uh, no, I never actually said I'm done. Okay. I, I, I definitely had a low point out at Winfield, which is mile 50. Yeah, okay, I read about that. And Yeah, so, but I... You know, just not having done enough of those events, I knew that your body goes in your mind, your energy, your muscles, your everything goes through all these cycles out there. And in a hundred miles, if someone doesn't have some stomach issues or some something happened, then yeah. they're superhuman. Yeah, totally. There are only a couple people like that that I know of, and even those people have their their ups and downs. And for me, it was a mile fifty out at Winfield, the turnaround point. Um, the crux of the whole race is, not the whole race, but going over Hope Pass, which is you know, almost 13,000 feet. You go over to Winfield to mile 50, and you turn around and go back over Hope Pass. So getting over that pass is uh, is hard, but at that turnaround, you have to turn around and go back and do it again, the whole course that you ran out on. And oh. At that point, my, my, uh, just my energy was really low. My hip flexors were just shot. But uh, yeah, I just turned around and thought, hey, it's gonna it's gonna bounce back or it's not. And if it doesn't, then you know I'm done. But I gave it the chance and I rebounded pretty well. Do you ever whoop and holler under bridges? <laughs> I do. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> well that's a good noise. I didn't know you could do a dove noise. See, there's the things about Dave Mack. Oh, it was an owl, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I got my birds all mixed up. Oh, is that a coyote? Yeah, usually they take off. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. It's a little mangy. Yeah. Oh, hey, bud. Hey. Hi. Aww. Besides your own, you know, mental fortitude, you know, talk about how your friends and family really helped you through all this. I mean, I'm guessing they were part of the part of the solution in a huge way yeah yeah especially when the accident happened and you know until and after the amputation it was yeah my family incredibly supportive um you know my my wife was pretty much picking up all the load of stuff that i couldn't do i mean i was still able to work you know a couple months after the accident um well, four months probably I took off, but she, you know, took care of the kids and family, and the kids are, they're, they're incredibly resilient, adaptive to situations, yeah. but Ava and Connor, you know, they're just like, oh, dad had an accident, oh, he lost his leg, like, okay, let's move on, and <laughs> I try to have that attitude, too. Kids are incredible that way, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are. And then my, the running community and all my, all my friends just really helped me out a ton yeah. in the hospital stays, and getting to from the hospital. Yeah, well, I remember it in Boulder, and I, I knew who you were. I didn't know you personally, but it was it was a big deal in the Boulder running community. Everybody knew about it, was talking about it, uh -huh. sending you their love, and 
It was big. You're a beloved figure. Mm -hmm. It was inspiring to see people really rally around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was a great, great support I had in the community. Yeah, it's people older and even nationally. It's uh, a lot of kind words. Um, yeah. And people reached out who had had amputations and injuries or severe injuries. And, um, yeah, it's helped me through. There we go. Let's go. Let's go. That Dave guy is always a nice guy. Open doors for people. <laughs> it's like, you know how it is. You're on a bike and you have to get off. If someone holds the gate, that's like gold. <laughs> it totally is. You're obviously an inspiration to a lot of people. I'm sure you get messages all the time. Who are some of your inspirations? And it could be like who you know inspired you back in the day just to even get into running. Uh, well, I started running, I guess during college to stay in shape for soccer and I just ran on the trails there and I was just kind of like oh I like doing this I'm gonna keep doing it <laughs> and then I moved to Colorado you know in 93 was in Brackenridge and discovered this trail race up there that my buddy Rich Cook put together at the BOEC uh -huh. which still exists the Brackenridge Crest Mountain Marathon and uh there's all that that culture of people back then Doing crazy mountain stuff. Yeah. Like I had no frame of reference for that, but like, oh, I can run a marathon. Huh? <laughs> I did a trail marathon or trail half marathon in Leadville. My first trail race back to that. Oh, people run marathon and this stuff, and I did it. And, and yeah, I got my ass kicked. I finished fifth place, but I was dying. <laughs> and then just realizing that the the whole ultra. You know, there's my ultra running. Just about trail running up there. There's no limits to distance. Yeah. I think I vaguely knew, but there's a hard rock hundred possibly, but I had no aspiration to do it. But as time went by, just you know, seeing all these crazy people doing crazy things, like, oh, I'm gonna try that, I'm gonna try this. And, <laughs> and then um, like Tom Sobel was a, he was an ass kicker back in the 90s, winning those trail races. Um, a tremendous snowshoe racer back at the time, I got into snowshoe racing back then. Matt Carpenter, you know, I tried to win Pikes Peak Marathon. I got second place three times for Matt Carpenter. <laughs> so just seeing, you know, what kind of animals are out there yeah. in the trail running world. And, and then, uh, yeah, I was going to all the ultra races and I, just, I, I, I had it to pinpoint one person. It's more like just, just everybody at these races are doing, you know, awesome things. And, uh, I was kind of, you know, it's inspired by everybody in general. Yeah, and what I love about the ultra world is really the community. People are so supportive. Yeah. And you know, 99% of the people doing the races are out there just to do a, a personal best or to complete their first 50K. And that's, that's really fun energy to be part of. So you mentioned something about like doing really hard things. And you were one of the first guys to run the rim to rim to rim across the Grand Canyon and back and set the fastest known time. Uh -huh. What inspired you and the other, the first generation of the FK tiers to, to do that kind of stuff? It was, um, yeah, back then that was, I guess I did set the record and I knew there was, you know, there'd been gradually some fast times going out there. I'd, I'd run the, you know, out and back. Um, one other time, just for you know, for fun, with just for fun, friends. just across the Grand Canyon <laughs> and back for fun. <laughs> and it wasn't high on my radar to go out and set an FK, FKT, you know, fastest known time, the big term now. It was more um, the last minute. Some friends were going out, and the week before, I was like, "Yeah, I'll join in," and I figured, "Oh, I'll just go for time, see how fast I can do it." Yeah. And just for that, and for that, I ran a, you know, just under seven hours, which is. The new record's like five hours or something. I yeah, think. Jim Walmsley, that's five crazy. <laughs> and your sweet spot's around 50 miles, is that right? Uh, in the past, it was, yeah, 50 miles or 100 kilometers. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, as far as like winning a race, 50K to 100K. Yeah. That's and awesome. Then, once I got to 100 miles, I get get through them, but <laughs> my stomach always kind of shut down. 100 just, miles is hard. Speaking of 100 miles, um, I saw on ultra sign up that you signed up for Western States. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I haven't been back there since the amputation, so that's kind of a, a focus race this summer. I'm gonna complete the, 
lead man series again. That's the plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, I gotta see how, you know, West Knowing you, you're gonna be just fine, but yes, it will be a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, um, I have a team we're registered for the Eco Challenge in September, too. Oh, cool, that's back. You know, that big adventure race. Yeah. yeah. That's oh, a wow. team, team event in, in Fiji. Oh, there. Is that your spirit animal? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably. Probably that coyote was. Yeah, that coyote is cooler. <laughs> They're wild. You scrappy coyote. Yeah, that's true. Excuse me. <laughs> He's a slow runner. He's, yeah, yeah. He's a cutie. If somebody out there is not even a runner or much of an athlete, how can they look to your story for inspiration? I mean, what, what's... What can be some takeaways for people out there that are going through hard times or, or going through something very similar to you? Yeah, my my story is kind of extreme. You know, I fell off a peak and almost, you know, I should have died from the fall and ended up losing my leg. So that's kind of, that's the far end of the spectrum. But more, most people are dealing with, you know, chronic back pain or arthritis and, you know, these things that are, just with you for so long, yeah. and, you know, often not fixable unless you have, you know, a serious knee replacement or get your spine fused. You know, those things are in some ways more difficult than what I'm dealing with. Um, so there's always something worse. I think I've learned from this whole thing. That there's, you know, what if I fell and I lost my leg above the knee? What if I hit my head or the rock landed on my head instead of my you know, which is 300 pound rock, I'd be dead, or I'd have a serious brain injury for the rest of my life. But there's always something worse. I guess that's <laughs> kind of a little bit gallows humor, but it's- No, I get it. You know, it really is. There's, there's always someone out there who's going through something harder, um, which is, doesn't really change the, you know, the fact that you're, you know, hey guys, that you're, dealing with something difficult, but, you know, things will probably get better. I guess that would be the advice I have. Yeah. Just keep pushing, keep finding your, your uh, working with your options to work through your difficulty. And um, things will probably get better. Yeah. Almost certainly. I like it. <laughs> and how do you, what do you do on the days that are hard? I'm sure you wake up some days and you're like, damn it. <laughs> oh yeah. I wish I had two feet. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of like that every morning. <laughs> oh, wow, great blue hair. Look Oh wow, <laughs> the great blue heron over here. <laughs> Sorry, this has been a nature. This has been a nature run. <laughs> a nature dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like every morning, get up and oh yeah, put this thing on and you know, the last eight ten hours like you don't even know you have one more. Yeah. You're gonna sleep. It's um. Yeah, it's it just you know you just get up and do it and you know make it. Try to make it happen with you know the day to day, and it's fine once I get going. It's like we've been, run, we've been running past 45 minutes here, yeah, and it's been you know a little bit discomfort, but I'm out of running not as fast as you know that guy, but <laughs> was, you know, just it's hard to run as fast as anybody it. in Boulder, <laughs> yeah. So. I'd like to work more with people who have uh, disabilities, or there are a couple organizations like the Ranger Motion Project. And, that uh, we're talking about prosthetics earlier. They, they help people worldwide with, not worldwide, but primarily in Central and South America, getting adaptive equipment. Yeah. Because those are the people who need it. But I'd like to be more involved with them. Um, I've done a couple events with them. I want to do more consistent support. For yeah. The Challenge Athlete Foundation as well. They do the same stuff here in the U.S. Very cool. Okay. So. Yeah, that's probably a long-term goal I'll be doing for a long time. I love it. Got to show you the view here for a second. Look at that. Look at that. This is our town, bud. Yeah, you know, snowy peak. Oh, God, it's so beautiful. Dave just told me that he once rode from San Diego to Maine on a bicycle in 1991. How was that? <laughs> it was fantastic. I, uh, I don't know why I did it. I grew up in Maine and, you know, it's like, there's a bike coming up there, but I wasn't involved in it. I just, uh, I, I was, uh, in college, I just wanted to take a semester off. I wasn't sure, like, wanted to study. I was like, why am I here? 
And so I was like, I'm just gonna bike across the country. <laughs> so like we all do <laughs> when you want to figure out life. Yeah, I'd never gone on a bike tour. My my dad worked at LL Bean though, so I went in and bought this new like Cannondale you know aluminum frame bike, which was the cutting edge thing back then. It was just a touring bike. And uh, just found the panniers and I didn't know how to cook or anything like that. <laughs> so um, not yet. And so I just found that stuff and flew out to, uh, found a one-way ticket to San Diego from Maine. Flew out and then stayed for a few days and then just came, I, just, I had road maps. I had no idea, I didn't go up by bike routes. I just looked at a road map and said, oh, I think I'll go this way. So I went kind of north, north and east a little bit, kind of across <laughs> Southern California. But the first day out of San Diego, I, it was a snowstorm. I mean, this was March. I had no idea about mountain weather in the West. <laughs> and it was your classic snowstorm in the West, except it was, you know, it's at 3,000 feet coming out of San Diego. Geese in the way. Hold on. Hey guys. I'm gonna get packed here. <laughs> People invited you in for meals yeah, and let you camp time. in their backyard. Yeah, I was like, you know, on a huge touring bike with panniers and like, oh, where are you going? What are you doing? You need a place to stay? And, crashed in some strange people's homes. <laughs> some, everybody was super kind though, overall. I'm convinced bike touring brings out the best in you and then the world as you travel. You see the best of humanity come out. It's yeah. inspiring every time I've done it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How yeah. long did the whole trip take you? Oh, like two, two and a half months, nice. probably. Yeah. And then you had life figured out when you were done. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not really. I knew I knew I was gonna go back to college, to school, but I was I was just like I didn't know what I wanted to study. So yeah, that helped a lot though. All right, my man. I think uh, we did it. Yeah. We went far enough. It was fun. Thank you Thanks, so much. Ryan. That was yeah. really awesome. Yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed this out there. I will link to some of the the media that he has, the articles. Uh, there's a new film about him that was made by Billy Yang. That is awesome. And uh, Matt Trappy. Matt Trappy, yeah, yep. Boulder guy. And uh, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and stay tuned for another Running with Ryan down the road. Thank you, bud. <laughs> sure, thank you. Whew.